Most important today, find a Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 14. There's one in the pew in front of you, use the one on your phone. Best is the one that you brought in your hand today. Revelation chapter 14. By way of context and catching us up, the last few sermons have all been sort of revolving around the same period of time. Each passage we've looked at has given us a review, but that review ends with a moment in time where we're about to enter into the judgment. The bold judgments are about to be poured out. So we've looked at it from Christ's perspective, from Satan's perspective. We've talked about the Antichrist. We've talked about uh, the false prophet. We, we've talked about so many perspectives, and they all keep winding up right at the same moment in time. And then we have another vision or we have an, another passage and it takes us back and we do that over again. Well, today we're going to do that for the last time. And so we're going to look at chapter 14 and just set your notes down. Don't even try to fill in any blanks for a while. We're not going to even refer to them. We're going to go line by line through this chapter because there's so many things. I have so many marks in my Bible, underlining, circling, all kinds of stuff. I'm just going to go through and we're just going to kind of talk about it as we go. Then if we have time, we'll go back to the notes and we'll fill in some extra stuff. So the notes are extra today. So look at, at your Bible, chapter 14. Put your finger on it as we go because we're going to make lots of stops. It starts with, then I looked. And I want to remind you that every time it says, then I looked or then I saw, like it does in verse 6, or verse 11 of chapter 13, it says, then I looked, then I saw, that's a new scene. So we're seeing multiple scenes being portrayed, visions, if you will, where, where John sees something, and then that stops, and then it's like another screen pops up, and he sees that, and that stops, and then his attention is over here, and he sees something new, and that stops. We're seeing lots of little, short visions that are all kind of taking place at the same time. And they all end with, and judgment is imminent. It's going to happen now. So we're going to see that pattern over and over again today. It's going to continue on. So it says, then I looked, and there before me was the lamb. Not a lamb, but the lamb. So we know this is Jesus Christ. Been called the lamb many times already. This is Jesus I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is Jerusalem. Now I'm going to tell you right now, we don't know if this is actual Jerusalem, a piece of land on the earth called Jerusalem, or if this is just a vision of Jerusalem. There's, there's indicators that could go either way. You read one part and you think, oh, this is on earth. This is actual Jerusalem. You read another part and you say, oh, no, this is a vision taking place in heaven. So we don't know. And it's, it's actually not important that either way, what we're supposed to get, we get. So I saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, probably the Temple Mount, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. 144,000, we've, we've heard this number before. We've seen people identified as 144,000 before. Remember, they were the Jews that were sealed. We didn't really know what it meant to be sealed at the time. We didn't really know what their purpose was or, or, or even who they were other than Jews. But 144,000 Jews were sealed. Now they're back on the scene, and we find out that they have... Jesus' name and God's name written on their foreheads. Now, that could be a single name because God the Father and God the Son are one. It could be two names because they're also independent. So it could be two names, could be one name, but it's the name of God on their forehead. And it's interesting that God, in sealing the 144,000, wrote his name on their forehead. He said, these belong to me. They're special. They're reserved for a purpose. They're mine. What's interesting beyond that is that we just read about Satan and how he came up with the mark of the beast, the number 666. And if you worship the beast, it was written on your forehead or on your hand. It's a reminder 
that, that everything God does, Satan tries to duplicate and he tries to kind of ruin, if you will. So God has put his mark upon these 144,000 and Satan says, hey, I'll put my mark on some other people and they're going to be special to me while well, they're his worshipers. And just a reminder that even today, Satan often tries to mimic what God does, tries to counterfeit what God does, tries to convince us that he's actually God and what he's doing is from God when in fact it's not. So we have to be careful. We have to be wise and we have to be discerning. We have to pay attention. But now we see these 144,000 people with God's name written on their foreheads. Verse 2. And I, had, and I heard a sound from heaven like a roar of rushing waters. Now, rushing waters can be calming, and they can also be powerful and a bit intimidating. It just depends on where you're at compared to the rushing waters. And like a loud peal of thunder, okay, impressive, um, kind of overwhelming. The sound I heard was like that of, a, of harpists playing their harps. Now, these are three sounds that don't normally go together. We have the, the rushing wind, the rushing waters, and we have the thunder, and we have the harpists. And this is all describing one sound. Okay, so he hears this sound, and it's, 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 it's calming, and it's intimidating, and it's impressive, and it's beautiful all at the same time. In verse 3, he said, And they, the 144,000, sang a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So this sound that's being heard is accompanied by a song. So this is worship. So Jesus Christ appears in Jerusalem with 144,000 sealed individuals, specially chosen Jewish individuals to be a part of his kingdom, and at this appearance, they break out into worship. That just tells you this is important. And it's, and it's, it's big. Verse 4, these, the 144,000, are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. So now we learn something about the 144,000. They're men. They're unmarried men. And, and, and they're virgins. The most important part for us is that they're unmarried men. It goes on and it says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. Now, first fruits refers to the first crop, the, the, the first result. A, a firstborn son might be called a first fruit. The first prophets are a first fruit. The crop that, that comes up first, the freshest, that's first fruits. It's the best of the best. It's the newest it's the most exciting. And God says these people are new and fresh and they're special and they're exciting. And verse 5 says no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now this doesn't mean that they've never lied and that they've never sinned. It means that since they've been chosen and since they've encountered God and since they've gone wherever he goes and since they've been worshiping, they are now in a state of blamelessness. They have been transformed by the presence of God, transformed by, the, by God choosing them, and, and now they are blameless. They, they are his people, okay? So this 144,000 is, is a very special group of people. I want to go back to the, them being men. Why would God choose 144,000 men? Is this a slight against women? Is it, is it saying something about the women? No, it's saying something about God. God has always planned to use Israel as the means by which he will bless the earth. His plan has always been that Israel would be such a nation that all other nations would look to Israel and say, Who is your God? And they would say, our God is Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth. And this is who he is and this is what he does. And, and you can be a part of this. And they would say, yes, I want to be a part of this. God always planned to bless the world through Israel. And God's plan has not changed. He has called these 144,000 men to be the first fruits, the first ones of this process. So when the millennial kingdom starts, when the thousand year reign of Christ starts, 
These will be the nation of Israel through whom God blesses the world. They start off as 144,000 men, unmarried men. After the kingdom is established and they're serving God, they get married, they have children. Look what God has done. Now we don't have 144,000 men blessing the world. Now we have 144,000 families blessing the world. If each family has, has two children, that's multiplied times four, 144,000 times four. So God is accomplishing what he has always set out to accomplish. And we should be looking for that in Revelation. He's doing what he's always planned to do. He's going to go into the millennial kingdom and he's going to bless the world through his chosen people. And these 144,000 he set apart as the starting place. So that's, that's what's going on there. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. That's the end of the first vision. Not very long, but that's what it is. Verse 6, then I saw, new screen, new vision. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. What's, what's another angel? What was the first angel? Well, there's been angels all over the place. We just need to realize this is a new angel. I saw a new angel, another angel flying in midair. And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. To every nation, tribe, language, and people. Now, that's about as basic as categories as you could break down to. What, what's being said here is that every single person on the earth is going to hear what this angel has to say. Doesn't matter what language you speak, doesn't matter where you live, doesn't even matter what tribe you belong to, you're going to hear what the angel has to say. Verse 7, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So they're proclaiming the gospel, basically saying, now's your chance, serve God. Now we're not told how long this takes place. These three angels, and, and, and the way I read it, represent the past, the present, and the future. So this is the past. How far into the past does it go? Well, I have no way to prove it. But my thinking says that these three angels were flying around the earth about the same amount of time as the two witnesses were proclaiming the gospel in Jerusalem. It's the same message, except it's going out to everywhere. Why that period of time? Because that's, that's what God did with the witnesses. And God's saying, hey, you know what? Not only did I do all these miracles, not only did I produce these plagues, not only have I done this and this and this, which I've shown you, I also gave you the two witnesses and by the way, there was also an angel flying around. An angel flying all over the earth, proclaiming this very clear statement, telling everyone, get right with God now, because the time is very quickly going to be too late. And I think God's just saying, you know, I've done everything, everything I could possibly do. If someone has chosen to reject me, they have literally chosen to reject me. They have said out loud, in effect, I do not want God. I'd rather have the alternative. That's the past. Verse 8, the present. The second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Babylon the great is, is the kingdom of the Antichrist. It, it's everything the Antichrist has been doing, everything Satan has been doing, everything the false prophet has been doing, everything we've been reading. That's, that's Babylon the great. And, and the second angel now says in the present, fallen is Babylon. The defeat of Satan, the overturning of the Antichrist, the end of everything that he's been doing is, is so certain and so close that I'm going to say it like it's already happened. Fallen. Fallen is Babylon the great. And then verse 9, the future. The third angel followed, followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury. Talking about what's about to come. If you have chosen to worship the beast, if you have chosen Satan, chosen the Antichrist, if you've chosen to reject God, then by your blatant choice you will receive the judgment, the earthly judgment that's due you. If anyone worships the beast... They will drink the wine of God's fury. Continuing on, 
which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. We might say the bowl of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Talking about future bowl judgments. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image. Or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Verse 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to his name. So this is going to take a little while. Got about three months left, give or take. Two to four months. Call it three. Got about three months left where all the bull judgments are going to take place. And God says it's going, to, it's going to require patient endurance. In other words, it's not going to be easy for you believers. The world is not going to be a happy place to live. People will be hunting you. People will be trying to kill you. People are hating you. But endure. It's almost over. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands. Verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. A second encouragement. First encouragement, it's going to call for patience. You're going to have to endure this. It's not that much longer. You can do it. And then he says, but if you die, you're blessed. If you die because of what's happening, you'll, you'll be blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. You, what you're doing won't be in vain. It won't be forgotten. It, it won't be for nothing. It's going to continue on. So, so basically hang in there. If you're a believer, it's going to get bad. Hang in there. It's almost over. Verse 14, a new vision. I looked. That screen's gone. New screen comes up. I looked. And there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the white cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, if you're like me, you know that uh, the phrase, one like the Son of Man, or the Son of Man is a phrase from Daniel, and your Bible probably even makes note of that, that that's a common phrase for Christ. But this is not Christ. It says, it looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a Son of Man. Okay, this is an angel, not the Son of Man, it's a Son of Man. This is an angel. He has a crown because he has authority, and he has a sickle because he has a job to do. Okay, verse 15. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is another indicator that that was not Jesus, because why would an angel be giving instructions to Jesus, right? But it says, Take your sickle and reap. Because the harvest is ripe. Harvest is usually a positive thing. We're going to gain what we have planted. We're going to gain what we have been seeking. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Now this is a, this is a vision. This is, this is a picture to communicate something. There is not an actual sickle being swung by an angel that harvests the earth. So we're supposed to be able to figure out what's, what's happening here. Well, it's not quite clear yet, so we're going to keep reading. Verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. So we know he's from God. Still another angel, who had charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. So someone with authority. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The grapes are ready. So far, it sounds very similar to the harvest. Sounds like it could be positive. Verse 19, the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Oh, not positive. The great winepress of God's wrath. Verse 20, they were trampled in the winepress outside the city and blood flowed out the press, rising as high as horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. If you look down at the bottom of your page, it probably says that that's about 180 miles. This again is a picture. This is, this is not an actual event 
where people are thrown into a wine press and trampled and their blood rises to, you know, six feet off the ground for 180 miles. It's a picture. We're supposed to get from this picture, this is really severe. This is really a bad thing. This is not what we were hoping for. So the first angel takes his sickle and he harvests. And it's the word harvest, and that's usually good. And we, we don't know much about that harvest, but nothing bad happens. They're, 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 kinda, they're gathered together. So we can say that, that the, the first angel gathers the, the harvest, the believers, to Christ. And then that's expected because this, this, the, whole, the whole book is about reconciliation with Christ and, and the believers in Christ being together finally without sin. So we're moving in that direction. So the first part we can gather means we're moving in that direction. But the second part, the second angel with the grapes, there's another harvest taking place. And it's interesting, it says, the angel swung a sickle on the earth. Oh, the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine. From the earth's vine, attached to the earth. Part of the earth. Kind of the unsaved element. So, so we have the, those being gathered for judgment. And this is new because we don't talk about this a lot, and it's not talked about a lot. But it is clear in Scripture that God will gather together those who believe, and they will receive their reward and God will gather together those who have not believed, and they will be judged. And their judgment will be severe. It's not a slap on the wrist. It's not a time out. It's not a short time in jail. It's, it's death. And, and the blood will flow, and it will be tremendous. And so what God is saying here is, I'm, I'm at the point where I am gathering together the believers. And I am separating out the unbelievers. And judgment is upon us. I will judge the righteous and the unrighteous. And, and the righteous will receive tremendous reward. And the unrighteous will receive a tremendous judgment. Okay. Now verse, or chapter 15, verse 1. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, new scene. Seven angels with seven last plagues. Last because with them, God's wrath is completed. There's that, we're back at that same point in time. It, it's just, it's about to be done. It's about to be over. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. In other words, those who had not bowed. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. What's that song? Here it is. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, kingdom of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, or bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. They're worshiping because of what's happening. Okay, They're, they're seeing this, they're hearing this, and, and their response is, you are just. You are holy. This is right. This is not too much. This is exactly the right amount. Verse 5, And I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. Think of a, a, a big door opening. And the seven angels. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen. And, and wore golden sashes around their chest. Then one of the four, four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God. We are so close now. The, the, the bowls are being handed to the angels. Okay, the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So we've been building up and building up and building up. Then we go back and we build up and we build up and build up. And then we go back and we build up and build up and go back and we build up and go back. And now we've built up again, but now there's no going back. Every scenario has been played out. Every scene has been shown. Every thing that God has been doing and God has allowed to happen has, has been exposed 
And now we're at chapter 16. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And, and that's for next time. But notice it's, 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 like, it's like pour them out all at once. We're going to read that they're poured out one at a time. But it is in such succession, it's like number one, then number two, then number three, then number four. There's only enough time to accomplish what's being done, and then the next one takes place. We are, we are right at the end. And, and that's, that's where we're going to stop. That's, that's the end of the passage we're going to cover today. And I wanted to get to the end of 15 because I, I wanted to get to now, next time we get together in Revelation, which will be in January... Okay, we're going to start up Revelation again in January. We're going to spend some time on Christmas and other things. Next time we get together in January, we are at the bowls. There is no more. It's coming. It will be here. And we'll study that. But let's look at our notes now. I, I hope that you were able to follow all that and able to see these things. But there's some, some more subtle things I want you to recognize. So number one in your notes the chosen nation of God is once again in alignment with Jesus Christ. I mentioned that. God has always wanted to work through his people. He is working through his people. He has not abandoned his people. Israel has never ceased to be God's people. The church never replaced Israel. The church has come alongside Israel and has played a role. But Israel is still Israel. They're still God's chosen people. And he is still going to work through him even in the millennial kingdom. So the chosen nation of God is once again in alignment with Christ. They are, A, the 144,000 Jews who were sealed by God in Revelation 7. We've talked about them. They are, B, the woman or Israel who was protected in Revelation 12, 6, and 14, where God said, I protected them from Satan. C, they are first fruits. We read about that today. First fruits of all those to be rescued by God from his wrath. And D, they are now righteous under God for the, probably the first time ever. The nation of Israel is righteous. These, this 144,000 will enter into the millennial kingdom as, as, as the, the nation of Israel under God's leadership. And they are righteous. And they are loyal to God. Their relationship with God has been transformed, has transformed their lives to be exactly who God wanted them to be. This is happening before our very eyes. This is what's being described. This has been one of those questions that in my mind has been hard to answer. How does, how does the promise be fulfilled that the entire nation of Israel will turn to God? Well, they will dwindle down to the exact number of believers and when they enter the millennial kingdom, every Jewish person will be a believer because only saved people will enter that kingdom. And then God will begin to work with them as they were always intended. To me, that's very exciting. Number two, just like God gathered the church to himself before the tribulation began, he is gathering unto himself the 144,000 sealed Jews before the bull judgments. I think there's some significance there. The church was raptured. And, and there was a purpose for that. The 144,000 is being gathered, and there's a purpose for that. God wants everyone to see who they are. God wants everyone to know they've been chosen. He, he wants them to be recognized by the seal on their forehead. He wants everyone to, to be able to rationalize and figure out what we have figured out, what God is doing here. He wants to put them on display and, and let everyone know that I'm, I'm still doing what I've always done. I haven't changed a thing. A, in your notes, they, they gather in, in Jerusalem or Mount Zion on earth. And again, we don't know if that's actual earth or just a picture of earth. I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards a picture of earth. Perhaps in the very spot where John measured the temple about to take back. Do you remember God making the statement, I'm taking back the temple. I'm taking back the earth. What Satan what Satan thought he had is no longer his, now it's mine. And remember, we measured the temple. Had John measured the temple because he was about to take possession of it? I think this may be that moment in time. This, this may be that very thing. He's taking possession of the temple. He is there now with the 144,000 they are worshiping. Number three, the angels fly over the earth proclaiming truth and judgment. 
I talked about the past, the present, and the future. Well, here's the truth and, and judgment they proclaimed. Angel number one proclaimed the gospel. He says, you need to be saved. You need to be forgiven. You need to be right with God, the God of, uh, who created the heaven and the earth. Get right with God. Proclaim the gospel and the necessity to embrace Christ. We don't know how long they proclaim this. Perhaps a very long time. I told you what I thought. I think this proclamation went on for a long time and ended about the same time the two witnesses were taken up to heaven. Angel number two proclaimed the certainty that Satan has lost in his efforts to, to dethrone God. Absolute certainty that Satan has lost. That proclamation has been made. Okay? Uh, it's, it's over. It's, it's done. You're defeated. And angel number three proclaims the penalty for worshiping the beast. This is, a, this is an earthly sin that surpasses, I think, all other earthly sin. No other group of people has seen God so clearly and rejected him so defiantly. And, and that sin of rejecting God so defiantly on earth requires an earthly response. And the, so the, the penalty is declared. If you worship the beast, you will suffer the God's wrath. And then number four, remember it said, blessed are the dead or the martyrs. Blessed are the dead for they shall find rest. Just making note that God didn't forget about them. God, God, they didn't slip through the cracks. They didn't accidentally die. God knew it was happening. He said, hang on a little while longer. And if you die, I'm with you. I'm going to bless you. What you're going through, it's, it's not for nothing. It's, it's going to be good. And then number five, the harvest and the sickle. God has already gathered the 144,000 together, but now Jesus will gather all who belong to him. He'll gather them all together. The Jews literally, the others figuratively, the Jews are literally gathered together, the 144,000. And the sickle sweeping is the figurative gathering of all the believers. And he says, I've already got the Jews together, and I'm going to get the believers together. But B... An angel also gathered up those who did not follow Jesus so that they could be crushed under judgment. Don't miss the metaphor. They would be crushed under judgment, both figuratively and soon to be literally. He's saying, I, I, I'm gonna, it's all going to come together. We heard so many times in the New Testament how, how the, the righteous will be blessed and the unrighteous will be judged. Well, it's, it's coming. It's It's now. What is the message of these three visions in Revelation 13, actually 13, 14, 15? And here's, the, here's the visions. Number one, God is now standing with this chosen people. Specifically, these are chapter 15. God is now standing with this chosen people to do what they were always intended to do, rule with Christ and worship God in a new song. I don't know if you caught that. That's what they were doing, ruling with Christ, worshiping with a new song. God is gathering his people together. Number two, God has already called for repentance, warned of Satan and his followers' demise, and promised judgment for those who refuse. He's, he's, he's made it clear. Number three, it's time to gather believers together and the non-believers together so each group can be dealt with justly. Justly. We have, you know, everyone wants to say, oh, God is love. You know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That's how much he loved you. How much did he love you? This much. We all want to talk about God's love. But if God's judgment and justice and wrath did not exist, his love would be meaningless. You get that? If there was no punishment, then mercy would not be a word. So, so God's wrath has to be there. His justice has to be there. The actual punishment for sin has to be there. If we get eternal life for being forgiven, then we get eternal death for not being forgiven. We choose to follow Christ. We choose not to follow Christ. He's actually giving us what we've asked for. Father, forgive me. Forgive my sins. Let me be a part of your family? Yes. 
Don't make me. I don't want to be part of your family. I want to be on my own. I'll deal with my own stuff. Okay. And we have heaven and we have hell. God is, is now going to separate the, the wheat from the tares, the, the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. And he, he's going to do this eternally, eventually. But he's saying, I'm going to start separating now. And continuing your notes, it seems, underline the word seems, because I can't prove it. It seems that all of the bold judgments are to fall specifically on the beast worshipers and not the God worshipers. It seems. Now, one of them says specifically that it's only for the beast worshipers. The rest don't say one way or the other. But things we've read, gathering together for the harvest, gathering together for the winepress of God's wrath, these things indicate that there may be a separation. There may not be. But it seems like there is. What are we supposed to gain from chapter 15? Well, the seven angels who pour out the seven bowls are in place, ready to pour. It, it, it's no longer we're ready. It's like it's, it's going to happen right now. The procession, did you see the procession? They marched out of the temple. They were handed the bowls. The only thing left to say is pour. And, and it will be poured out. They're ready to pour. Those who are martyred during the tribulation so far break into worship. That's the response. That's our response. That should be our response. Wow, man, I can't believe how God God is being right now. He's being more God than he's ever been before. I see God so clearly now. His power, his omniscience, his sovereignty, his ability to fulfill promises, his ability to care for those who belong to him, his ability not to get lost in the details. He's, he's being so God right now. It's, it's just on display. It's the light is shining so brightly. And our response is to worship. That should be our response. We should, we should leave here every Sunday going, man, one, I'm glad I won't be here. Two, I hope people respond because there is no greater call to God than what he's putting on display during this time. And what's coming next? What are we going to study next? We're going to study earthly judgment for earthly sin. That open-handed defiance that, that we've talked about. Number two, we're going to study a thousand, year, thousand years of Jesus ruling the earth from his throne in Jerusalem. That's still to come. And three, we're going to be looking at eternal judgment for both the righteous and the unrighteous. And remember, judgment isn't always a bad thing. Eternal judgment for the righteous, we often call reward. We, we get what God has promised us. So we have the judgment still to come. So that's still to come. So we're going to take a little break. From now on, when we come back, we're going to pick it up right there at chapter 16, and we'll finish the book. Um, but I wanted to get right here, because we're right at that point. Every week has been building to this point. Now we're here. The bold judgments are next. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for allowing us to be together. Thank you for the message, for the pictures, for the illustrations, for the visions, Thank you for putting yourself on display. And Father, we do worship you. We, we bow to you. We recognize who you are. It's, it's amazing and unbelievable. And thank you for the millions of people who will be saved during this time, during the tribulation, and, and those who are still alive at this very moment in time where we're reading. Help them to endure. You, you say that's their calling now, endure till the end. Give them the strength they need. And then thank you for the reward they will receive. Father, we look forward to being with you one day, and, and we rest assured that, that every promise will be kept, and every statement you've made is true, and, and, and we, we give ourselves to you. Thank you for being our Lord and our Savior, and if anyone here doesn't know what it means for you to be Lord and Savior, give them the courage to talk to someone and ask the right questions so they can discover that, and they can become part of the family of God today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.